Hey everyone, so we're putting out some pieces from before the pandemic that we think are particularly relevant now as the polarization and the struggle to make sense of the world has only increased in the time since we made them. If you're a long time fan, you've maybe already seen these, but maybe they're worth watching again. This film was called The Science and Psychology of Polarization, but we're putting it out now called The Science and Psychology of Difficult Conversations. If you go to our website, we've arranged all of our films into categories, and there's one for this category. Also on our website, you can add your email address and you'll get our newsletter, which is a deep dive we put out every two weeks. And we also give access to extra films for mailing list subscribers. So hope you enjoy the film. Hey guys, this is the first of a series of films about the science and psychology of polarization. And it's something that we've been working on for quite a while. I've uh, got some really interesting interviews with uh, Peter Levine, Stephen Porges, and with Alex Evans. And it's kind of a, a topic that we've been talking about for quite a while, generative dialogue, conversation. This is kind of delving a little bit deep, more deeply into that as a, as a subject. And this introduction, we're going to try and sort of tie together the, the whole series, give a sort of briefing of why we think all these pieces fit together. And also to say what's really interesting, and there seem to be a lot of people who are zeroing in on this kind of area at the moment. What's exciting for me about this is that this is something we've been talking about since the beginning of the channel. And part of the reason that the intellectual dark web was so interesting, you know, people getting together from different sides of the political spectrum or, you know, with different cultural values, sitting to have a long form conversation over maybe you know, two or three hours. And the promise of that was that this was a, a way to really overcome polarization and to find a new synthesis. One level is to be able to sit down with someone and have the conversation without um, attacking each other, let's say, to put it in an extreme. The other level is for that conversation to go to some new territory. And I think that, for me, is the really interesting thing. And so this is one missing piece. I think these... these um, it's almost like the foundations. Yes, yes, exactly. And so, you, you know, you mentioned psychological safety. There's that, and there's also a lot of other elements that come into it. And I think this is the... This is exciting because this is one of those absolutely key elements without which, you know, I don't think without understanding the biology and the psychology of these conversations, I don't think they can be done. It's not like a nice to have. I think it's absolutely essential. And I'm just going to play a quick clip from Stephen Porges that I wasn't going to play until a bit later, but I'm going to play it now because I think it fits this perfectly because he talks about better living through neurobiology. As we understand the neurobiology of what it is to be a human being, when that becomes our guide, then culture and life becomes better. I, I put on one of my slides a couple of days ago uh, a, a kind of modification of what DuPont, the chemical company used to say, used to advertise better living through chemistry. That was their, their slogan. And what I was saying was really maybe better living through uh, understanding neurobiology. I think it's also worth noting this isn't just about having difficult kind of political or cultural conversations. This is about life. This is about how do we have conversations with each other? How do we have conversations with our partners? There's that classic phrase of, if you think you're enlightened, go and spend a weekend with your parents. You know, it's, it's about how we, have a, how we stay in our centeredness and have conversations in general. So yeah, as we've talked about, like this kind of understanding, I think, is the foundation. But what's really important is sort of building from that foundation and then what, what, what's the real world impact? And that's why it's really exciting to have an interview with Alex Evans. So I'm going to play a short clip from him now, because he, he was a government advisor for many years. He was involved in a lot of um, summits around climate change and sort of big government policy and became quite dispirited because what he realized was all of the work of government was talking about the externals. and It was almost never talking about the internals. And so he went on a bit of a journey around sort of understanding polarization and learning more and more about psychology. And now he's launching something called the Collective Psychology Project. I mean, one of the ideas at the heart of the report that we've just produced is the idea that the inner and outer crises that we see in the world and inside us are two sides of the same coin. So on the one hand, you have this sort of pile of crises out there in the world, like climate breakdown and hyper inequality and mass extinction and so on. And then over here, you've got this pile of mental health crises like suicide and self-harm and anxiety and depression and addiction and so on and so on. And 
What I'm arguing in the report is that at the moment, you know, these two sets of crises are fueling each other. We feel messed up uh, inside, partly because we feel like the world is messed up out there. And when we feel messed up inside, when we're kind of triggered, we act out in ways that worsen the state of the world. So again, it's another example of a feedback loop. Now, you look at mainstream politics as it is today, or for that matter, the kind of campaigning that you get from big global NGOs, it only talks about the outer stuff. It's all about you know, issues in the world of out there. And it's just silent on the question of the states of mind of the citizens who are voting or the policymakers who are making the decision. It's sort of, you know, they're just completely separate. So one of the things I find particularly interesting, not just about what Alex was saying, but about this entire topic, is that there's lots of different levels to it. You know, so Alex is talking about, you know, government tends to look at the systems level, but needs to also look at the individual level. And those two things are, you know, as he says, two sides of the same coin. And then there's the biological level of understanding where my biology is while I'm doing it. So there's all these different layers to it. And I think what seems to be happening right now is lots of people are coming in from different angles. And hopefully, and what's very interesting is, what does a synthesis look like? And, what is it, and how do we take that synthesis and use it practically in our kind of day-to-day -day lives? So it was really fascinating to see the journey that Alex had been on from a completely different starting point, the starting point of like politics and systems change. When I was chatting with him, he had exactly the same reference points that we're familiar with from our counseling training. Polyvagal theory, somatic experiencing, Peter Levine, Stephen Porges, all of this stuff. And they were, they're like, in a way, sort of like superstars in the counseling and, and in particular in the trauma world, because they were the ones that really understood how the body stores emotions and how the body, tra um, how the body metabolizes experience. And this, this kind of work is just, I think, absolutely crucial to bring into the mainstream, bring into the, the sort of political and the conflict world. And understanding that, especially now and, and more and more, under the influence of social media and under the influence of kind of ever expanding and ever increasing pace of life, we're all in some sort of low level overwhelm a lot of the time, or a lot of us are. So this kind of work becomes essential to navigating those, those kind of spaces. And we were lucky enough to get an interview with Peter Levine when we were out in America recently. If you're talking to two people who are in the hyper-vigilant state, the sympathetic adrenal state, or the shutdown state even more so, you can't engage with them because you perceive them either as threat or as mortal threat because your nervous system is stuck in that groove. And so there's no way you can really listen to another person and, and express yourself so that they want to listen to you while you're in one of these stuck states. You have to be able to come into the social engagement system. Yeah. Could you talk about like the physiology of this? Like what is actually going on when we're in these conflicts with each other and when, because what I also understand is that we stop listening to each other at a certain point. The polyvagal theory gives us a very clear map of exactly how that works and what it looks like. You can see the facial expression. When somebody's in fight or flight, they're mobilizing the jaw and the neck is tight. When somebody's in a state of, uh, of social engagement, the eyes are relaxed and open. This part of the, of the, the face is, is the one that's more active or the one more engaged. Okay, so when you're feeling like this, you will not be able to feel like this. So, so again, we read signals from each other's faces, from each other's postures. And if we... Subconsciously. If, subconsciously, all the time. We all do it. We may not be aware that we're doing it, but we're all doing it. And referencing back to something that a lot of the sort of more avid fans of the channel will be aware of, Jordan Greenhall and his kind of concept of broadcast versus digital and discernment. What that does is it puts a huge amount of impact on the individual which is why individual sort of regulation and, and our own psychology and our own biology become so much more important. And you notice how much of a burden is placed on the individual now. It's not like the broadcast modality where most of your agency is limited to a very narrow band and you're really relying on the causal structure that you're embedded in to do almost all the work. In the decentralized collective intelligence, for it to actually work, almost all of the agency is actually on the individuals. You have to have really, really effective, responsible individuals. 
Uh, and by responsible, what I mean is they're they are able to respond to the environment in the way that I'm talking about. They are not reacting. So I think one important thing to add to that is that while it starts with the individual, it doesn't stop with the individual. So, you know, um, Jordan Hall talks about this concept of sovereignty and, you know, what you were just describing, kind of coming into our own agency and our own discernment so we can start making sense of the world. But we have to make sense of the world with one another. So we have to find a way not only to be sovereign in ourselves, but to be open and contactful with one another and to figure out, okay, how together can we be in a mode where we're starting to make sense of the world better than one of us could by ourselves. So to come back to Alex Evans and the Collective Psychology Project, a lot of his work he did in, in Israel. He went to live in Israel for a while and just saw how in Israel in particular, everyone is in a state of kind of low level uh, hypervigilance at all times on, on both the Palestinian side and the Israeli side and how that affects politics there and how it makes things very, very difficult because if you're in a hypervigilant state, it's very difficult not to, see the, to be in a sort of fight or flight response and see the other as an enemy. It's almost impossible. And he then draws parallels with what's been happening in the, in the UK and the US. I'm going to play another quick clip from his interview. I took a sabbatical for six months um, and went to live in Jerusalem with my family um, for that period. And obviously the political polarization there is even more extreme. Um, and at one level that was incredibly depressing. And I could see the kind of similarities with Brexit or with Trump's America. I mean, obviously it's more extreme uh, in Israel and Palestine, but nevertheless felt like it was on the same spectrum in some sense. But what was hopeful uh, when I was there was finding the work of a few psychologists, people like Gina Ross, who are arguing that really to understand polarization there, you can't divorce it from its mental health context, particularly the fact that continuous traumatic stress, which is a bit like post-traumatic stress disorder when it's not post, when it's just an everyday ongoing reality, that of course that catalyzes polarization because the classic symptoms of continuous traumatic stress are things like anxiety and hypervigilance and especially othering, kind of projecting everyone onto some idealized shadowy other. Um, and when enough individuals display these symptoms, of course they start to manifest politically too. And, you know, of course, the, the other reality there is that people live in this constant low level state of threat perception. I mean, Israelis are constantly uh, at some level perceiving threats of terrorism or of rocket attacks or even of invasion. And then Palestinians are constantly perceiving the threat of arbitrary arrest or of their house being the next to be demolished or of just living in kind of conditions of more or less total surveillance. So everyone's triggered all of the time. And then, you know, I mean, at another level, you look at that and you think, well, I can see how this plays out in a kind of conflict zone like this. But Actually, is it, re is it overreaching a bit to say that this is also relevant to Brexit or to Trump? And of course, I'm not saying that, you know, most voters in Britain or the States are traumatized in the strict medical sense. But the threat perception absolutely shows up. When you look at opinion polling of why did people vote Trump, one of the strongest predictors for that was this sense that the American way of life is threatened. And it was the same with Leave voters in the UK many of whom, clear majority of whom agree, like, you know, Britain increasingly feels like a foreign country and that makes me feel uncomfortable. So there's threat perception on that side. And then, of course, as soon as you've had the presidential election in 2016 or the Brexit referendum, all the kind of um, liberal, cosmopolitan, internationalist type people also wake up feeling like they're living in a foreign country and that makes them feel very uncomfortable. Now you know how it feels. Right. Almost. And so the threat perception is contagious and this is the big risk that it becomes a kind of self-amplifying feedback loop. And so one of the questions right at the heart of the Collective Psychology Project is, well, how would we reverse the polarity of that feedback loop? So instead of, you know, these kind of mutually reinforcing, you know, threat perceptions across the political spectrum, we have a kind of mutual reinforcing process of sort of healing and coming back together to a sense of empathy for each other and respect for each other's experiences and how we reach the values that we've got and so on. I mean, my only concern with that narrative is that it can seem almost condescending because you're sort of saying, and when we talk about these things, when we talk about Trump or we talk about Brexit as being only a product of sort of fear, it, it can sound like more of the liberal elite kind of thinking, well, we know better than you what, why you've done something. How do you avoid that in the narrative around this kind of right. conversation? 
Well, I think, I mean, as I say, I think the issue of threat perception is by no means confined to one side of the political spectrum. I think, on the contrary, it's something that's sort of cropping up here, there, and everywhere. But I mean, of course, you know, you can look at, for instance, membership of the European Union and make a completely trenchant critique of the EU on very solid, rational bases um, that has nothing to do with threat perception or fear or anything like that. And I would, as it happens, buy a lot of that critique myself. There's much about the EU that needs reforming. But I think when you look at the state of our political debate and how much kind of triggering there is and how much just heat and you know, projection there is in the discourse, there's something deeper going on here as well. Yeah, he mentions Gina Ross, who's an expert in this field and has been working particularly with conflict for a long time, who I caught up with the other day. So when you think about it, people are approaching the resolution of conflict in a very rational, reasonable manner. But where is the attention to the emotional foundation? And these are the aspects that are not being uh, addressed when people are trying to come up with very rational, intelligent, cogent solutions for problems. But the emotions don't care about that. If I don't feel safe, I don't care how reasonable your solution seems to be. That's not going to affect me. So what I then saw that was very, very important was to really marry the two fields together. So I developed a protocol actually that combines the two on an ongoing basis the whole time. So one of the key words for me is curiosity. And it's a, it's a really interesting word because it means when, when we're curious, we accept the idea that we don't know the answer. Like there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of natural ability to be open when we're curious. And one of the light bulb moments on a recent course, though it was actually a breathwork course where they were talking about polyvagal theory and somatic experiencing, was where they started using that word curious and were saying that it's impossible to be curious and defensive at the same time, which is a really important thing. And that I think fits into the nature of like any kind of generative conversation is about curiosity. You can't be curious and traumatized at the same time. The physiology, uh, it doesn't allow them to both be there. So if you can get the client, enlist the client in being curious about their sensations and, 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 and images and feelings, then you've gotten halfway there. I think there's a useful link from the world of uh, kind of meditation research here as well. There's a, there's a woman called Shauna Shapiro who's done a lot of studies on meditation. She talks about um, its three elements, its attitude, attention, and intention. I think it applies very closely to staying curious. You, you know, it's, it's very easy to be knocked off into thinking I know or I disagree with that. I, I'm just waiting for this person to shut up so I can jump in and, and put my point across. Often in meditation is called a kind of a soft alertness. And that's a, that's a skill to cultivate because it doesn't just come naturally to any of us, to any human being. And you know, you have to kind of literally engage your prefrontal cortex so that you can stay present and stay with it. So it's a, uh, it's kind of a, for me, it's kind of a dance between psychology and biology. That's, that's a constant um, process and you get better and better at it uh, the more you practice it. The other interview we've got with one of the pioneers in this field is with Stephen Porges. And Stephen Porges came up with polyvagal theory independently of Peter Levine, but when Peter Levine and Stephen Porges met, they immediately connected because polyvagal theory validated and explained what Peter Levine was seeing in his practice. So Peter Levine was having these understandings and realizations about how emotion and trauma was stored in the body and realizing that a lot of the time the body was intimately connected with what we normally consider psychology. And polyvagal theory basically grounded that in neurobiology and it, it works primarily on the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the, the longest nerve in the body. It comes from the brain and goes to all of the major organs. It also goes to the face. And what polyvagal theory explains is firstly how we're constantly getting information from our, um, from our gut and from our heart. And our heart is actually connected to our face. And we're also then connected to other people through that. So we're constantly regulating our nervous system in relation to other people and in relation to, to what's going on inside. Polyvagal theory has several features and we're going to go through a few of them. 
the important, the first important one is that it gives us a way of organizing our own bodily reactions. And it really emphasizes that the neural, which really means the brain regulation of the autonomic nervous system, the neural system that regulates the, the organs within our body, followed an evolutionary uh, trajectory. So we had a very primitive autonomic system that really was about uh, maintaining uh, metabolic resources. So it was very much oriented in, if there wasn't enough oxygen, enough food, it just kind of shut us down. Okay. Then with evolution from these ancient vertebrates that had only one, a very ancient old vagal circuit, and that old vagal circuit was unmyelinated. And myelination is really the fatty substance that coats a nerve. And if it's myelinated, it can actually convey the signals more efficiently and more specifically. But in the very ancient vertebrates, they only had this older dorsal vagal system. But we still have it. It's the primary system that still goes to our gut. And the major defense response that the autonomic nervous system for these ancient vertebrates was basically shutting down, immobilizing, death feigning. Um, through evolution, a sympathetic nervous system came on board, and that one was a spinal sympathetics that came on with the bony fish. And you can see them moving and even stopping. So now you have an autonomic balance of mobilization through the sympathetic nervous system and an immobilization of that old vagus. And then what you have with mammals, and this is the interesting part of polyvagal theory, is something strange and something miraculous that occurs with the transition from the ancient extinct, extinct reptiles to mammals. And that is you have a newer vagal circuit that's myelinated that helps calm or coordinate these, the older vagal circuit to support homeostasis and to enable sympathetics to work without getting you into fight or flight. But the other miraculous part is that the area of the brain that regulates that pathway of the vagus is not the same that regulates the old vagus going to the gut. It's linked to the nerves in the area of the brainstem. It's linked to the part that regulates the nerves that regulate your face, the muscles of your face and head. It regulates your social engagement system, your ingestive system, the way you touch and connect with the world. So it's really this kind of remarkable transition where our heart became connected in a neural way to the, the nerves that regulated our voice, the intonation of our voice, our facial expressions, and even our ability to extract information by listening. So there are muscles in our middle ear, our facial expressivity, and the intonation of our voice. So now we project our, our heart in our voice, and people know that intuitively they respond that way. We project uh, our feelings in our face. So these become the important parts of how we make connections with others. But the bi-directionality, so that we're in a sense if a person is in a physiological destabilized way, their voice is very different. And we often, if we're good therapists or good human beings or good parents or good teachers, we know that. And we calm them and how do we calm them? It's not the words that are powerful. It's how we use the words. It's the intonation of our voice. So polyvagal theory emphasizes these evolutionary stages, but it also emphasizes that under challenge, under demands that could be illness or threat, our autonomic nervous system shifts state. It moves from this social engagement safe state and where we are connected with others, it moves to defensive states and how we're also then transmitting our own internal state through our voice and through our face to other people and how important that is for what they call co-regulation, so regulating ourselves in relation to other people. And how does this theory or theoretical framework apply to, say, conflict and mediation? Well, it defines conflict, doesn't it, in terms of that in conflict, so people feel that there is a threat or their bodies feel there's a threat. Uh, to have remediation, you have to provide sufficient cues of safety so that you now get into a dialogue. Now, a dialogue, by nature of being the word, implies some reciprocity in the interaction. And when you, do res when you have reciprocity in the action, you have a listening component as well as expressive component. So you have a witnessing component. So it, 
part of, I think, the major issue of conflict is that people don't listen to each other. So they're not witnessing. And if people don't listen to you when you try to talk or express something, or let's say you're even a child and you're not being listened to, what happens to your physiological state? You become very uncomfortable, you become frustrated, and as you get older with those same feelings, you become angry and belligerent. And so we have to understand that being listened to, being witnessed, not necessarily being agreed with, but being witnessed and appreciated for what you're saying is really part of our birthright. It's something that we scream to, to have. And polarization is, occurs when people aren't listened to, they're not witnessed, and they feel marginalized. Just to join that together with the polyvagal and kind of real or genuine conversation is because what polyvagal theory shows is that either we're in an open frame of mind, we're in what they call the ventral vagal circuit, where we're, we're able to connect with others, we're able to take in new information, we're able to be curious, or we're in a defensive frame of mind. And when we're in a defensive frame of mind, we're, we're pretty much unavailable. And that shift can happen quite quickly. That shift can happen very quickly, even in a conversation where, and developing that awareness of when we're slipping into a defensive frame of mind and when we're slipping into, and when we're more open, and then hacking that um, neurology or hacking that physiology is gonna be an important or essential thing for us to learn to have these conversations. And I think a key point here is that these are skills and let's say a way of being that we have to practice and cultivate rather than something that we can decide on the intellectual level, oh, okay, I'm going to drop into the having that. Next time I have a conversation with, with my partner or someone I disagree with uh, on Facebook, I'm gonna just drop into this. No, that's, that's not how it works. We need to really cultivate these skills. And I think someone who's been doing that extensively and with, with success is Jamie Wheel, who we've put out a few interviews with and, and had one quite recently on the channel as well. And I think it's very interesting to hear him talk about what actually happens when you're getting people into groups and getting people into flow. What are some of the things, some of the practical techniques we can use to actually, uh, you know, practice these skills? Because we're in a culture at the moment where the conversation just keeps seeming to break down again and again and again. Yeah. And this kind of understanding, like the neurophysiology of coherence or the neurophysiology of connection seems really vital in that. Yeah. Would you, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I would almost, um, I mean, the short answer is yes, because there's no, there's no opportunity for tribal primates to be in coherence without that also having a, you know, showing up in the kind of stack of our bodies and brains for sure. So if we're, what we want is the ability to have a nice conversation together, the ability for us to have that nice conversation sits on the foundation, right, of bodies and brains and hearts and minds and attunement. And whether that's simple things like mirror neurons, or it's more complicated things like overall neurophys neurophysiological resonance, um, that is for sure um, another lever for us to play with. So, you know, the, the business school Isade in Spain um, that we I wrote about in Stealing Fire, the idea that they took a strategic business problem and had a bunch of MBA students try and solve it together, you know, with one-way mirrors and biometrics tracking them and all this kind of stuff. And they figured out, okay, who are the emergent leaders in this group? And, and they backed out statistically you know, how much people talked, how loudly people talked, the words they used, even what they actually had to say about solving the problem. None of that stuff was statistically as significant as the fact that, that those leaders, those emergent leaders, could regulate their own nervous systems and do it in a way that entrained other people into their states. So it's a little bit like that old story of, you know, Galileo entering the watchmaker's shop and seeing, you know, all the, all the clocks on the wall swinging in time with the one with the longest pendulum. So that idea of the longest pendulum entrains all the others into that field, that to me has been my inquiry really on the sort of biohacking space. There's lots of the longest pendulums in our bodies. If we had to pick, I mean, there's a gajillion things we can map, track, measure from brain waves to heart rate, to heart rate variability, to neurochemistry, to posture, to respiration, to affect, you know, good, all sorts. But what are the one or two or three that if you get those right, the entire rest of our bodies and brains cascades into coherence, and then that's a strong signal. That's now, that's lengthened our pendulum, and now we are far more likely to bring others into that coherent state. And so, 
before we get to kind of what you know you might call communitas or like a highly coherent group presencing something greater than the sum of the parts. If you find yourself in an attempt to have a coherent conversation, meaning we're trying to do something that um, none of us know what's going to come of this, but if we play it right, something better than any one of us separately could have thought of. Right? Let's say that's kind of a version of the game we're playing. And things start to go sideways. Right? Somebody gets hijacked. Somebody starts engaging in an older, less functional pattern you feel triggered, you want to react, you know, that's that right there. The first moment is, you know, this, this is man's search for meaning, right? It's the, it's the stimulus and the response and the space between what's happening and my reaction to it. Therein lies freedom and redemption. So a couple of things, and this is, you know, granny wisdom 101, which is if you're about to get angry or say something off the cuff, take a deep breath. <laughs> right? Actually take several deep breaths and specifically engage in, you know, what free divers call vagal tone breathing, which is just the idea of ex like a 10 second exhale with a two second hold. So exhale, fully empty your lungs. Once your lungs are completely empty, hold them for two seconds and then just fill your lungs. And you can do that at a table. You don't need to announce it. You can just actually use that and just take five of those and you will match. And in fact, if you do it, uh, a friend of ours um, is a neuroscientist at Stanford, his name's uh, Andrew Huberman, and he's done fascinating research where if you combine eye gaze, so if you kind of go soft focus, meaning that you're focusing your eyes to the outside of your frame, and you do that vagal nerve breathing, so the super slow exhales, a hold with inhale, and you do it through your nose, you completely drop your physiological threat response. You just chill the fuck out super fast. And so that would be the simplest. And people might think you've just kind of spaced out <laughs> where you're not there. But yeah, if you can just go soft, soft eye focus, so you're not laser focused and you're not focused on something immediately in front of you, and you do nit basically nasal exhales, um, then that will really calm you down further. The next would be, and, and part of the reason for the nose breathing, um, the Karolinska, Karolinska Institute in Sweden has done some fascinating research on nitric oxide. And that correlates with some research at Harvard that basically said nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter and it's a gaseous molecule and it takes stress response stuff out of our brain and it shunts it all away. And it brings in feelings of you know bliss, you can call it the bliss molecule, right? So basically anything you can do in your body to increase nitric oxide is usually a good thing for stress response and resilience, right? So that was the Harvard research. Then the Karolinska Institute has found that nasal breathing increases it three to five times. And that if you really want to get freaky, vibrating your nasal cavity as you breathe out through your nose, so hmm, something like that, or if you were playing a didgeridoo or playing a clarinet or a trombone, that actually increases nitric oxide production 15 times. So if you slam all these together, you're like, okay, I'm going to breathe, I'm going to exhale slowly through my nose with visual focus to the periphery. And I might, depending on my social situation and my comfort level, even hum as I do it. That is actually going to calm me down and give me a reset. So that's a true straight up kind of biohack. I don't need to think anything to do it. Just do it and it will have some positive effect. The next is now a bridge. What's the bridge between neurophysiology and psychology? And then even higher level judo would be, I'm not trying to fix it, change it, shape it at all. I'm simply going to notice it and name it. And with a little bit of practice, I can speak that truth into the shared conversation. And quite often you'll find a, you'll find that the whole thing can drop to the level where, oh, me too. Or, oh, thank you for saying that. And then we're back to that level of resonance and coherence, not from follow me, I'm super stoked. This is all amazing and I'm going to be this bright light. It's more like, actually, let's actually orient around what is happening right now and what are the truths we can explore if we can stay in this place together without judgment, without naming the emotion, without then creating the narrative, without enacting triggered trauma responses around it. And that actually is arguably an even more magic place for us to get together to forge coherence, which is wherever the hell we actually are <laughs> versus some effort to escape it, fix it, mend it, transcend it. My sense, I think, is that this is still quite cutting edge, maybe marginal, but it's definitely, the conversation's definitely moving in that direction. And that's where I'm really interested. 
personally, that's where I'm always interested. Like, where is the mainstream conversation and where is something that's just on the fringe of it, but it looks very promising? Psychedelics, for example, for the last six or seven years, I've been looking at journalistically and thinking, okay, that it will shift. There, there will be mainstream interest in this. And it has, I mean, we're now in what we call kind of the new psychedelic renaissance. There's definitely mainstream interest. And I think mainstream interest in the, sci the sort of collective psychology and therefore the kind of neurobiology of all of this stuff is coming. I mean, this sort of, so it's interesting to look at what, what has kept this out of the mainstream conversation for so long. And I think there's a few different factors. I think a, a lot of it is based in this kind of Cartesian dualism, Descartes' classic sort of split in the 16th, 17th century of splitting mind and matter. And that's had a huge impact uh, ever since of seeing all of these things as separate. But there's a, there's a new holism and there's a new kind of understanding of how these things fit together, how the body is in, intrinsically involved in, in the mind, for example, which is what all of this work is, is bringing back into psychology. And then also then psychology being intimately involved in, in, the, in the political world and in any kind of policy changes. Yeah, I think that, that for me is one of the big things is that, that Cartesian dualism and the way it plays out in culture and the way that just through our education, through even our language, we are much more comfortable with what we know than what we don't know. And much more comfortable being in this kind of disembodied intellectual space often than in the more liminal, flowing, let's say chaotic space. Um, Ian McGilchrist has got a really great model of this for anyone who's interested. We've got a few interviews on the channel with him. You know, he's done great work around looking at the left brain and the right brain, which is a lot more complex than just left brain logical and right brain kind of creative, as, as people used to think. But I, ironically, there is actually some truth in that as well. And so he argues in part that we're in a very left brain dominated society. So it's very much the left brain is focused in part on what we know, what we know we know, uh, whereas the right brain is focused in part on what we don't know. And so that, you know, we've talked quite a few times on the channel around having conversations that are more liminal. So that means that they're more in a space of not knowing. And again, that concept of curiosity comes up. You know, curiosity, inherent in the idea of curiosity is I don't know, because if you knew you wouldn't be curious. And so there is a biological, again, a biological aspect to it, there's a cognitive aspect to it, and there's a cultural aspect to it. And there is a shift happening in that. And I think all these speakers uh, are part of that shift. So yeah, on that subject of how this has been sort of kind of not included in the mainstream perspective for so long, I spoke to a guy called Steve Haynes, who I've experienced, I've done a couple of his courses, really, really interesting. Uh, body worker who knows this stuff really inside out. Our ability to feel is fundamental to how our mind works. So cognition, memory and emotion are rooted in a readout of our physiological state. And I'm offering here through the most of this interview is that our physiological state is primarily am I safe? And if I'm not safe, I go fight or flight or freeze. So if that's happening, my feelings that inform my mental state of cognition, my memory and my emotional state will be coloured by the fact that I've got this danger physiology running inside me. So to embrace that means embracing the messiness of what was historically hysterical emotional states in a body that weren't our Dr. Spock fantasy of a rational human being who would analyse and, analyze and work out. What we're really doing is sort of feeling and attaching to things that feel right. So an idea is valid because it's elegant and somehow it tastes right or it smells right or it, my body can ease into that state because those numbers fit together in an elegant way. So feeling is the root of rationality rather than rationality, mind and pure thought being this separate sort of special entity that was the purview of, of a psychiatrist. It's a much messier, embodied place and feelings are central to the whole process of consciousness. Yeah, and it's really interesting and exciting that quite a few of the people from very different backgrounds uh, have the se sense that things are moving in this direction and it might be an idea whose time has come. But what we're not seeing is that synthesis of recognizing that you know, our mental health, our state uh, of mind matter for the state of the world and vice versa. But 
I think that's partly because this isn't an idea that's really surfaced much until recently, and now it feels like a lot of people are converging onto this territory. I mean, I don't feel at all like the Collective Psychology Project's the only player in this space. I think a ton of people are sort of converging on this space, which gives me a lot of hope. It feels like this is something that's kind of ripe, that's ready to you know, mature and take root in the world. And I think, therefore, like, you know, I, I don't see this as like expecting massive pushback from people who work in politics on this stuff. I think that it's just a question of we have to figure out how to start seeding it so it can take root and sprout. We are a connected species. And if we don't appreciate that, we are, in a sense, injuring the species. And we have to take on a responsibility. The bottom line is, I think, there are going to be more and more people having this understanding because now you have, with polyvagal theory and neurobiology, that supports the philosophical and for many people even the spiritual religious view. So you have a convergence of different orientations all ending up in the same point. This is really embryonic work. We have no idea what's actually going to fly, what are going to be the interventions that can really have a transformational impact and go to scale. I think the larger question is how do we create systems and platforms for lots of little experiments, many of them very small scale or very local, and for making sure we share the learning from those experiments among a kind of evolving community of people who feel like they are practitioners of collective psychology. So that when we fail, we do it quickly and we make sure that as many people as possible have access to the lessons from that failure. So hopefully this film has kind of tied the topic together, made sense of it, and also made you want to go and watch the other films, uh, the whole films. So we're going to release them over the next couple of weeks. If you want to get early access to see them all now, you can become a supporter and they're in the members area of the website. So subscribe, uh, also sign up for notifications, just click the bell button below if you want to make sure that you get notified when those go online. And also we're going to be running events in London over the autumn. Yeah, we're going to be doing something a little bit different uh, this autumn. Um, so we're going to have a series of events where we're really trialing and growing, let's say, a protocol of how do we actually get into these conversations and how do we do it sustainably in a way that could be replicated potentially in different cities. So we're, it's quite exciting, you know, so we're um, going to be announcing that soon. It's going to be quite a few. Uh, they're going to be focused on different practices, techniques, and we're hoping to build a kind of core group of people who really want to um, kind of go to the edge, I guess, and then kind of level up in a new way. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.